All right, now we're ready to move on to our uh, silk shading, or sometimes you'll see this referred to as needle painting or thread painting. And it's all about using a single strand of floss uh, to block in color in a way that transitions smoothly in between colors and creates a more complex shading and shape array, adding dimension to your work. So I'm gonna work with my darkest green uh, floss, starting at the base of my leaf and coming along this vein up to the tip, similar to what I've already done over here. When we stitch in this method, we're using something called a long short stitch for a majority of it, meaning that every other stitch is gonna kind of alternate in length, and that's really gonna help us create shape and dimension and blend our colors together. So we'll start here in the middle where I'm gonna take a short stitch and then a long stitch, and I'm gonna keep the edge that I'm starting with quite blunt because I'm gonna want a hard contrast between all of my greens on this side and my yellowy orangey colors that are going to be up in the top as if this flower is starting to, or this leaf is starting to turn color for the season. And long short stitch is a bit of a misnomer. It's the important thing about it is that you're keeping your stitches staggered so that you can blend, but you don't have to do every stitch long and then every, uh, every other stitch long and then short, long, short, long, short, etc. It can be long, short, long, longer, short, longer. <laughs> like, it's about getting a nice blend of, of movement happening in the piece. It's not, there's no one perfect way to do this. Generally speaking, you want to work along the pattern in a way that you're blocking out sections at a time and then moving forward. Um, a lot of people don't do that. I frequently don't do that. And then I often go back in and rework areas I've already worked a little bit to add a bit more dimension or a bit more color or to add a highlight. It's a little bit free form, free flow. Uh, do what works for you. I'm not really into this idea that there's a, a right or a wrong way to embroider. There are thousands of people with thousands of different techniques and slight variations on technique and whatever works for you is the right answer. So play around with this and don't get discouraged if your first couple attempts don't feel like they're really giving you the results you need. It takes a little bit of time and a little bit of uh, practice before you start getting good at this technique because you're working on such a small scale. But what will help you is really keeping your stitches nice and snug together or if you are leaving gaps, make sure that it's intentional because you're leaving room for another color to lay in there. You don't want to leave any fabric showing through when you're doing silk shading. Now that I've sewn in my first blocked in color, I'm going to switch to a slightly lighter green and start sewing into where I've already stitched. The idea here is that I'm going to keep staggering my stitches and then I'm going to be able to sew into from the outside my first color so that I get a nice lovely uh, transition into this new tone. And what's really quite successful is if you look at how a leaf is really shaded, really go out and find a photo or walk out, it's fall right now, uh, and see how these leaves turn colors and where these colors change at and mimic the, the harsh and unexpected transitional moments. You might get right, some lovely splotches of orange or yellow or red in an otherwise green leaf. Um, so really keeping an eye on what nature is providing for us is really very useful when you're working on this sort of technique for the first time or continued. I mean, maybe this isn't your first time and maybe you just uh, are practicing. It's always good to look back at nature whenever we get the chance.
All right, this is where things get exciting, and we're going to add our third color in, and I'm going to start getting even more transition. And you'll notice that we're really going to work with multiple strands on multiple needles simultaneously. So if I need to fill in a bit more along this now chunk of fabric, and I want a different color, I'm going to work them simultaneously. And that is a wonderful example of silk shading. Uh, in total, I used, let's see, three shades of green, uh, goldy yellow, and a brownie orange. The more colors you use and the larger the space you have, uh, the more you can do with it and the more dimension you can get out. And if I would have used three more shades of green, you, we would have less stark definition here and it would blend a little bit more. Wasn't really my goal with this piece. Also, it's about an inch long. Uh, not a lot of room for a lot of colors. You certainly can, however. Um, I could go back in here with a few more shades and break some of this color blocking up, but I kind of like it, and it's kind of very uh, of a piece with a lot of Jacobean work, where you do get some lovely silk shading, but it tends to be a bit more color blocked, and using block shading tends to be a bit more popular. So this is a nice little middle ground. Let's move on to our little bulbs at the top, and then we're pretty much done. For our little circles that are left, I'm gonna do some uh, colonial knots, some clusters of colonial knots in two different colors. So I've threaded up some uh, light orange and some darker orange that are the oranges I used here and in here. Um, you could do something else here. Any service stitch would do as long as it fills the space. And you could certainly do something like a woven wheel, but I'll tell you a secret. I hate woven wheels. I think that they look really tacky. So I'm not gonna use them in this project. Uh, to do a colonial knot, it's really similar to a French knot. And a French knot almost looks the same. So honestly, you can do either one, whichever floats your boat. But I like a colonial knot because it gives a nice little dimple in the middle, kind of like a little donut. And I think it looks really cute. Try this again. You want to take your needle, wrap it under your thread that's connected to your hoop, and then take your uh, source thread and wrap it the opposite direction. So you're going to get what looks like a nice little uh, slip knot on your needle. Bring your needle all the way down into the fabric, almost exactly where you came out of, a few fibers over. Uh, pull that knot down to the bottom of your needle, and then keep your finger on your tail yarn while you, or your tail thread, while you uh, pull this down into the fabric. And pull it nice and slow, get it there, let go at the very end, and then you'll be left with a really lovely uh, little disc with a dimple in the middle. And I'm going to do a cluster of these. So let's do a few more. So wrap under, wrap over bring my needle down to the fabric, pull my yarn or my thread down nice and gently, and then hold it in place while I pull it down. It's really important that you always keep your finger on the floss and keep tension on that while you're pulling it down into the fabric, because if you let go, it's really easy for it to get all fakakted on you and just become a huge tangled mess. And when that happens, there's no saving it. It's just what it is, and you got to cut it off and start over. All right, now, if the colonial knots were giving you trouble, and that's just not the technique that you're into, you can also do a French knot. French knots are really, really, really simple. All you need to do is grab your yarn as if to make a loop, wrap it three times around the needle, drag it, put it back in the fabric, drag your knot down to the bottom of your needle and pull it through. You're gonna get nearly an identical look as you do 
to the colonial knot. Uh, they're a little bit chunkier. I find them a little bit harder to control perfectly. I have a bit more success being consistent with my colonial knots, but a lot of people like the French knot because it is a little bit simpler to do, and you work it in almost the exact same way. All right, and that's the end of the pattern for our Jacobean floral-inspired sampler. I'm going to turn my hoop around and then just put my initials in it, and we can look at using a nice little stem stitch if you want to put your initials. So I'm going to stitch these in orange, and I'm going to take the world's teensiest little stitches as I do this. And I actually think instead of a stem stitch, I'm going to use a whipped back stitch. So first I'm going to just stitch my letters with a back stitch, the whole outline real quick and pain free. All right, now that I've worked a back stitch with my initials, I'm gonna start back at the end of one of my stitches. And I'll start at the bottom of this P since my thread's already over here. And instead of sewing through the fabric, I'm gonna work my needle underneath every single stitch and I'm gonna work in a consistent direction. So essentially I'm whipping, which is why it's called a whipped back stitch, over all of my stitches, which will really clean up the shape and it'll make all of the little stitch marks disappear. So it's almost like it's a little floating piece of string when it's done. And it's really very pleasant. This is my favorite stitch to use when I'm doing things with tiny lettering because it is so, so professional looking. And it gives it a nice little sheen. All right, and she's done.